So um, let's let's start. Uh, yes, I think people can see you. And uh, and welcome uh, to you here and uh, and also to the people online. I saw seeing that we have two speakers, but already a few are also participants online. I'm Jerry Session, Luca Bertolini, uh, I'm uh, from the University of Amsterdam in the Netherlands. And, um, uh, and people online, uh, let me already say that um, Anna, who's helping me here with the uh, technicalities, uh, is doing this, can uh, chat, chat, can uh, make, ask questions uh, online, and we try and, and, and shift uh, between online sites. So it's an experiment. Uh, we are here today about experimentation experiments, but I will also say in my own speech, experiments uh, are for learning, and so they can fail as long as you learn from them. So let's be relaxed and see this also an experiment. I'm sure it's going to work. Well, the topic, the topic of this session is, um, is how to motivate people to walk. And I think that the nice thing, as I don't know whether you, you went through the, the contributions, is that we, we see different approaches to that. Right? We see approaching using technology, uh, social media, or appro approaches, uh, approaches using experience, uh, like uh, uh, walking meetings uh, uh, at work. And I think one of the ways I would look at it, uh, to invite you to look uh, at it, is not so much yeah, the, the question is what is the native form? Uh, yeah, maybe that's one way of thinking, it, but another way could be okay, that's what works with whom, for what, in which context. Yeah? Probably the, the, the best way, the most interesting way to look at this as a sort of emerging uh, toolbox with different ways <laughs> of, uh, of uh, 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 motivating people to work. Uh, so I'd like you to, to look at this, to ask that question maybe in mind. When you hear well, each representation, of course, we are here also to be uh, critical, but also uh, constructive, trying to understand uh, from uh, each other. But at the end, we have a better understanding of maybe limitation, but also possibilities of different ways of motivating people. So that's the collective uh, aim. Uh, we have uh, four <laughs> speakers, uh, two uh, are here, and we'll introduce them in a while. Two are uh, online um, and you see them already active. Uh, in, in the top to the speakers, uh, probably you've read in the in the in the uh, explanations uh, you have 12 minutes for your presentations and that's in order to have eight minutes of uh, QA and and uh, it, 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 yeah and of course if you talk too long, it will be, go at the cost of QA, which is a pity because through the interaction, the exchange is what these things, uh, uh, these things are about. When there are two minutes left, I will show them as we figure out how to do it online. If you have something in the chat or I come out, I show two, two uh, with my hey, welcome. Um, and uh, and you know that two minutes are, are, are left. Um, I think I've said what I have to uh, say, and uh, with this, and with the help of Anna on the way, um, I'm happy to give the word to our first speaker. Uh, uh, she's Kate uh, Pamborn from the um, uh, she's University Academic Fellow at the Institute of Transport Studies at the University of Leeds. Probably well known for you if you are in the world of transportation research. And, and just look at the website, she does an incredible lot of of super, super interesting, important stuff, but she's also does a lot of work on the role of pervasive uh, technology in, in treating behavioral change. And that's what she will uh, talk about, uh, about us, uh, talk, uh, share with us, uh, with us today. So having said that, I leave the floor to you, okay? Thank you very much, Should have updated my biography. It's been promoted. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an associate. Thank you. I'm an associate professor. Okay, yeah, so thank yeah. you very much. Um, yeah. So today I'm really, really glad to be here. This is my first visit to Ireland, um, and um, it's my first um, in-person visit to Walk 21. I had my name on a poster when it was in Bogota with my my research assistant, and he said it's me. 
Um, and um, today I'm going to talk about progress um, that project that was first um, introduced to the Walk 21 community um, in Colombia. Um, and this is sort of the capstone of that project in which we actually tried to translate some experiments about understanding the perceived persuasiveness of messaging into, uh, into a real-world experiment to try and understand whether those messages perceived as persuasive were actually objectively persuasive and actually persuasive. Any way I should point this? You? Okay. Yes. Okay. You're the conductor of. Uh, yes. All right. So, um, what I'm going to do, and hopefully I will fit this into 12 minutes, perhaps not, um, is to introduce um, the overall program, which was called Adapt, um, what the initial headline insights from that were, and then the aim of, of the final trial that I'm presenting today, basically what is and isn't in presentation because I still got quite a lot of analysis to do. Um, and final trial is our better point study. So then I will explain a little bit about um, how that was structured um, and why I chose better points as my um, industrial partner for this project. Um, and then I will um, give you the preliminary findings of the future work. And hopefully then we'll have a really nice discussion. And um, we'll go over there. Yes, okay. So, uh, oh, too much. Okay, oh. this is very trigger friendly. Anyway, let's get that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what I'm presenting today, as I've explained, so um, basically it's the in the wild trial that I did with Better Points Limited. Um, and what I'm trying to understand from this is whether the values presented in a message to people via a smartphone app that were previously perceived in online experiments as persuasive actually have a measurable impact on walking and actually cycling. We, we, we had two sets of messages. Um, and I will talk a little bit about some of the challenges of carrying out this as a collaborative research project with a, um, a software partner. Um, some of the highlights, um, et cetera. What I'm not able to present today is um, what the differences in perceived persuasiveness or objective persuasiveness were between what we call the placebo messages and the intervention messages, because the data set is really huge and I haven't finished analysing that. Um, so we also asked questions about participant message recall at the end of the experiment. Did they remember receiving those messages? Um, so I haven't analysed that. Um, and I haven't analysed yet the, the interactions of their behaviour in response to the messaging with age, gender, main mode of travel, and personality traits. Okay. Very helpful. I'm using my way. Would you like me to advance the slides for you? Uh, yeah, just trying to get back to where I should be. Oh, this is really jumping forward. Okay. Yeah. So, the background to the whole project why did I do this project was because I come from tra uh, transport geography, transport studies. And although travel behaviour change campaigns have been run for a really long time, they have quite limited success. Um, and increasingly, we're faced with new technology and transport, with contactless ticketing, smart cards, app journey planners, mobility as a service. And also there's an increasing diversity in urban shared modes now, such as bike share schemes, docked and dockless, um, and also um, the e-scooters, which are, are, are increasingly appearing car clubs, there's a, there's a really big sort of ecosystem shared um, mobility modes now. Walking is not in this ecosystem, um, and I'm pretty worried about that because it is at the top of the transport hierarchy if we want to be more sustainable. Um, the other problem with these things in our pockets that are influencing our behaviour is that they're designed to be quite addictive and user-centric, 
and satisfy our existing preferences rather than change our preferences. So if you want to change preferences through mobility as a service and journey planners, you need to know more about how to do that. Um, so that, that is more advanced in healthcare than it is in transport. And in transport, we have a fundamental lack of knowledge about effective message content and the structure of those messages. Um, and that limits our ability to, to target the behavior change messages. Okay, so I'm just gonna quickly go over this, but for each experiment and perceived persuasiveness um, experiments, uh, we had a battery of 16 statements, messages, but walking, and we did the same for cycling. Um, and these were uh, systematically varied according to the argument type, which is down the, that's the, the, the row labels, and the argument value, what was the value within the message that it was arguing for, and that's um, the column title. So we chose on the basis of existing travel campaigns and environmental psychology, we chose convenience, environment, financial, and health as the values that we felt were likely to be uh, effective, uh, we, that we wanted to test. And for the argument type, we chose ad populum, which is a little bit like uh, eight out of 10 cats, uh, whatever brand of cat food it is, that's the, you know, it's the sort of social norm. Um, the authority message, where it is uh, a sort of scientifically based uh, recommendation. A consequence message where things will happen if you do this, or good things will happen if you do this. And then there's the practical inference where you basically just say, uh, walking is healthy, therefore you should. So we also had a lot of other variables. Um, we were interested in um, segmentation, which is quite widely used in transport. My colleague, Gillian Annabel, has done a lot of work in that area. So we used um, some per segmentation questions to understand that our, where our participants were in relation to their attitudes to, to transport. Um, and we grouped those um, into three uh, sort of super segments. So the drivers, the potential non-drivers, and, and the non-drivers. We had an idea that personality trait might have an impact on how we perceived messages. So we included the mini iPad questions, uh, which put people in uh, onto a scale for each of these personality tra traits. You don't sort of fall into one category here. You have uh, a place on a spectrum for each of those characteristics. Um, and I've already mentioned um, the features of the arguments, um, but we also had the other more typical features of participants um, from, from demographics and use of travel behaviour. So I've already said, um, given you the clue that we measured stated persuasiveness. Um, I also did public transport, but I'm not presenting that today. Um, we also compared the travel attitude segmentation with personality as a predictor of our persuasiveness. We had 400 participants in each of our experiments. Because we used Mechanical Turk, um, their user base has a male bias, or it did at the time that we did the experiments. So there are many, many more males answering questions than, than females. And we, um, although we did not treat gender as a binary, we didn't have statistically significant numbers of um, uh, non-binary participants. Um, we didn't give all the people all 16 messages for each individual mode experiment because that would be very burdensome. So we randomized as long as they got one of each type and one of each value. So they had four messages in total. And, uh, and what was in the arguments was based on reliable sources. We didn't just make it up. So what did we find? We found that argument type, the structure of the message, didn't really make a huge difference. Um, we found that the value did make a difference. There were several significant interactions. You can see in the graph there, the bar chart, that uh, for both um, walking and cycling, blue is walking, orange is cycling, but we're mostly interested in walking. Um, so for walking, health was the value that came out top in perceived persuasiveness. I don't think from other 
types of research, that's very surprising. Um, environmental slightly crept ahead of financial. And um, convenience comes really, really low. People do not see walking in, uh, as convenient as being an important value. Um, and actually, funnily enough, they didn't for cycling either, which was actually quite a surprise. Um, although we did not note that the cyclists, whose main mode of travel is cycling, they rated convenience significantly more persuasive than non-cyclists. So you have to do it to understand that it's convenient. Two minutes. I uh, haven't even gone on to the main bit yet. So, um, and yeah, convenience wasn't great for women either. So we don't need that. Uh, I should get extra time because of problems with the slides. Yes, you do. <laughs> okay, so, so what we did next to end all of this off was to work in the wild. Uh, we wanted to know with real people leading their daily lives what impact the messaging might have. Um, and better points noted in discussing it right from the beginning of my project, they really wanted to work with me. We just had to find a way of making it happen. Um, the benefits of working with them is that their platform has been out there for 10 years. Um, it's very well developed. It's had a lot of investment in it. This is something that's well out of reach of most academic projects. They have a pre-existing user base, so there's an immediate sample. Um, and their terms and conditions for their users actually cover the use of data for research, which was tremendously helpful with my ethics approval. Um, but the data set that they've got is actually both quantitative and a little bit of qualitative data. It's really rich. Um, and it says, you know, Hannah put in, she works with a bunch of points, she put in that it was rapid deployment of studies. I would put it as a sort of medium rapid deployment of study. There were a few things we needed to iron out. Um, the limitations are that their app is a very feature-rich app. They run campaigns for transport authorities, local authorities, health trusts to incentivize active travel, uh, walking, cycling. And it has uh, an automatic node detector built into it. Um, it. It gives people challenges, it rewards them, they get points, they can exchange those points for vouchers for their favorite coffee shop or money off Alfred's or other cycle stores are available, um, which makes it really difficult to challenge, uh, a difficult challenge to isolate and test the individual components of your campaign. Um, so um, also their users are self-selected. They've chosen to download this app and use it. Um, it's quite messy. Some of them, there's missing values sometimes due to people disengaging and disengaging with the app. And to actually set up my experiment required their specialist expertise. Um, yeah. Okay. So we ran an eight week trial. We had um, from uh, the users who weren't uh, enrolled in any specific campaign, so they weren't receiving incentives for walking and cycling at this time. We randomly allocated the people that agreed to participate into three, one of three groups. The control group got no messaging. They just had the usual tracking within the system and were incentivized to answer three surveys during the course of that eight weeks. What we called the placebo group got messages that they were kind of generally positive quotes about walking or cycling. And everybody got all the walking and cycling messages because we recruited from those who were walking and or cycling. Um, and the intervention group got the messages based on the values that we found affected from previous experiments or more effective from convenience anyway. Um, we pushed the messages to them in the evening uh, because we believe that that is when people are more likely to be reflective about what they might do in the following day, not in the breakfast rush about how they're going to get out that day. Um, and also, Better Points gives you an opportunity to validate your daily trips in the evening. So that's the time when they're more likely to be engaging with the app. Um, everyone was rewarded in the same way for completing each survey, and they got a bonus for completing all three. Um, and messages were received for four weeks. So there was two weeks baseline, four weeks of intervention, and then two weeks of continued tracking. Um, and that's when the other surveys, the final surveys were presented. Okay, people received the push messages three times a week. Okay. 
Yeah, they were eligible if they were between 18 and 19 years and had used the app within the last 10 weeks. If they only showed run activity, we removed them from the sample, we removed missing gender. Um, and this sample is, is biased more towards women than men. Uh, more than half of them do both walking and cycling. Very sluggish remote control. Can you move my slide on? Thank you. Okay, so these are the messages. So you can see what we call the placebo group, what they got. They got things like nothing compares to the simple pleasure of riding a bike, which apparently was said by John F. Kennedy. Um, Hippocrates, the famous Greek philosopher, apparently said, if you are in a bad mood, go for a walk. If you are still in a bad mood, go for another walk. <laughs> um, so these are sort of slightly, it's important to realize these are sort of slightly sort of pulling on, on emotions here yeah, rather than promoting a particular value. The intervention group messages, they're really based on practical influence. Inference, they're quite dull, but they're factual. Um, and that's important to remember. So we were testing the intervention messages and the placebo ones we came up with just so we could have three drinks. And what did we find? Skip this one. So this is what we had in our sample. Each group had 115 people. Um, we tested, just checked how uh, they looked in terms of duration of membership of the app. And it was similar for each group. And you can see here the number of walking trips. There's quite some differences between groups. Um, and same for cycling. See the number of cyclists. You can see how they responded to the survey. But note, note the walking trips number, please. Okay. Can you move that on, please? Thank you. So what we found was um, there were significant groups uh, between the walking. Uh, for, for the walking, um, and um, that was overall. When we did the pairwise comparison, we found that the, the, real, the only significant difference was actually between the control group and the placebo group. That's really annoying. <laughs> um, but actually, it's not a failure. So we've learned something. Um, can you move on, please? Thank you. Uh, yeah, you can move that one on. That's just to prove I did it. <laughs> and that one. Thank you. So I think what we can say before I've done all the rest of the analysis is that the walking messaging certainly appears to have a measurable and statistically significant impact on overall walking activity um, without any other incentives. Um, we found that the generally positive quotes, the sort of things that are more like a meme, maybe if we put cat pictures on it, it would be even more effective. <laughs> Um, they're more inspirational for getting people to reflect on maybe what they might do tomorrow than arguing for dry facts. Um, we can maybe test that more using A-B testing uh, to try and, and, and get further into that. We can't do that with better points. Oh. What's happened here? Just said no thanks. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Nice. Um, we know that this is more female bias, so maybe these sort of mean like things with potential cat pictures will work better for women than men. I don't want to get into that argument. Um, but also, there is a limit to this. We cannot rely on messaging only. We need to have all the other things. But the onus on behaviour change is not just on individuals. Um, what we don't know, what we can potentially test, because we do have postcode data for the participants, is whether there was a difference between those who had good access to decent infrastructure, um, were maybe walking more than others. Um, so there's a, there's a lot more research to do on this data. Yes, at the end. Can you, can you, yeah, ongoing work. I've got more analysis to do, and I'm working on how to get these unsolicited messaging into mobility to sell the samples. Should be a thank you, sorry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, well, we don't we, we kind of ate in the in the Q and A, but let's 
you know, I think we are here also to get some engagement. Let's get one or two questions just to start some interaction of this. Yes. Hi there, Mark Harris, Intelligent Health. So you mentioned early on in the presentation that the health messaging was best for walk-in. Do you know, uh, do you have any data on which type of message type it was that were it best, or was it health messaging overall? Or have you had the chance to go into that TV? Uh, for, for that experiment, not really had a chance to really look into that yet. Um, it might be quite difficult to tell because we cycled through the messaging. Um, and then it could be when I look, when, when I get the chance to look at the trajectory of people's walking behavior over the course of the experiment, um, what might happen is that there's a cumulative effect of getting those messages three times a week and because everybody got them in the same order, health and environment finance. Um, it may not be possible to tell from that experiment whether the health one was working best, but we would be able to repeat the perceived persuasiveness of them because we ask those questions in the same way that we did in the earlier experiments. I just haven't found one. Really intriguing. I'll, I'll keep a close eye on it. Thanks. Okay. Well, thank you. <laughs> yes. Hi, um, Sylvia Thompson from the Irish Times. Just briefly, you mentioned there that um, we're working to get these messages into mobility apps. Yeah. Could you just explain, um, at the moment in the mobility apps, are there no inspirational messages, or do you think this is something that needs to be approved on? Or? I think it's something that's really great, and it's one of the motivations for me doing this research, because my observations of things like journey planners and mobility service apps is that they're not including that sort of thing. They're really just giving you a journey plan and in the in the more advanced ones the opportunity to book and pay for the one that you want. Yes. Um, and for incentivizing walking, that's a bit tro troubling because it's not monetized. So yes. there's no nothing to pay for. Yeah. Um, and but clearly some trips which are short you might get off the journey plan for a taxi, but it might be better for you to walk. Um, and um, for the social good aspect of these things, when transport authorities are involved in commissioning them, and having some input into their governance, really need to consider that. Um, and um, the architecture, the, the system architecture at the moment, maybe doesn't allow for that kind of messaging. So that's what I'm, I'm working with, actually, a system provider in the UK to, to discuss and explore how we want to do that. I really like your, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, let's see. Hi, Chair of the Tennis Sports Partnership. Uh, just, I, I may have missed it, but were the, the participants in the study already signed up to the better point? Yes. So, were they self-selected self to be into that in the group initially or in the better points app? Would the challenge be more for the same people who, you know, would be a, another study group who could investigate yeah. those that don't select to be in uh, such apps? Yeah, I, I can't think the methodology that's, that I've got funding for to, to yeah. do that. So, but that would be interesting. a similar project. The, the challenge was getting people to actually sign up. Yeah. Uh, I, I was in a big hurry to get this study done before I ran out of money. So this was, in a sense, convenient. But also, the the business model that Better Points had um, is that some so they work with health authorities in the UK and other places as well. Uh, and so sometimes people are actually given a sort of so a prescription to sign up for this uh, through the health business, so that they're being encouraged to to do this for health reasons. So they may be sort of not fully self-selected, but they'd they be pointed towards it. <laughs> yeah, great you. question. You have to close, but there will be other moments and show you. But what, what, what one thing I, what I really like is your kind of discovery in the end that the placebo might is a real thing. And in a way you could even think, okay, work that through maybe we need on our mobile app is to yeah. messages. Yeah. I'm going to follow that. Yeah, definitely. Uh, definitely. That's it. That's so interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. I'm here all week. So, yeah. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you.
flexible with the time. I think uh, we should really should give speakers and participants uh, 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 something for uh, uh, being here. So now we move um, online to Melody uh, Jakob, who's there, and as we do, let's see whether I can do this. Hello, can you hear me? Okay, so I will start to share the screen. We we cannot hear you, but I guess Okay, okay, <laughs> great. So let me know if you can see my screen. Can you see it? Okay, perfect. So I'll just start. Okay, so hello. Today we will talk about first time experience of walking meeting and how we can create design onboarding solution to promote this practice at work. So we implemented a study in collaboration with the University of Luxembourg and Fontys University of Applied Science. So first, what is a walking meeting? It's a meeting that takes place during a walk instead of in an office, boardroom or coffee shop where meetings are commonly held. So it's a meeting that you can conduct outside or inside while walking. So we conducted a study which aimed to first identify the perceived drivers and barriers of first-timers, to do a walking meeting with first-timer and to collect their first impression, to map their experience, and to, search, to analyze their practices of meetings three months after the study. So this study contributes to give insight about first experience of walking meeting and to provide design opportunities to promote this practice. So first, I have a question for you. I would like you to open your professional calendar or refer to it and choose one upcoming meeting. And according to you, could this meeting be held as a walking meeting? Yes, no, maybe. I give you a few seconds to think about it. According to you, could this meeting be held as a walking meeting? So we ask the same question to certain office worker with no experience or only a few experiences with walking meeting. And we ask them this question before doing a walking meeting. Then we did a walking meeting with them. And then we interviewed them at the end to collect their first impression. So this study was divided into three parts, the calendar task, the walking meeting, and the interview. And the first step consisted of the calendar task. So it consisted of asking participants to select in their professional calendar one meeting that they think could be a working meeting and one meeting that they think could not be a working meeting. Then we categorize all their answer based on the time of, type of meeting they selected. And according to the participant, information sharing and one-on-one -on -one meeting were more suitable for working meetings than other types. Through this test, we also collected the perceived barriers of first-timer that we categorized based on the literature review. And we found out that, for instance, meetings that require note taking, presentation, and document sharing are less suitable for working meeting, which is a case of brainstorming, for example, where you need visual support. Another barrier was the group size. So when there are two participants in the meeting, it is more difficult to conduct it while walking. And through these studies, we also um, try to collect the perceived drivers of first timer. So when a meeting was online, for example, 
several participants thought that they could do it while walking, especially if it was just listening to, to the meeting. Walking meeting is also an opportunity to get some fresh air and participants thought that it, it can be more stimul stimulating for them, especially because they are physically active. So those were the perceived drivers and barriers of first timer. And then we did a walking meeting with them, which lasted on average 25 minutes and we collected their first impression. So participants stated that a walking meeting, it's an enjoyable activity. It's pleasant, it's interesting, it's fun. They also highlighted the fact that it's a healthy practice because you exercise your body, you're physically active. But they also highlighted the fact that it, uh, the success of a good walking meeting depend on, depends on the environment because some of the participants were often distracted by the environment. During the walking meeting, we also tracked the pass using the application Strava. And we asked the participant at the end of the walking meeting to sketch the pass they took on a map. And what we found out is that what was interesting is that participants were free to choose the path they wanted to take, but they all apply different strategies. So for example, some participants decided to go in one specific direction to go to the park or to get away from the traffic. Some participants also decided to take a path that they well know or on the contrary that usually they never take. Most of the participants also anticipate the whole pass based on the time that they have for they had for the meeting, but others completely improvised along the way, so different strategies. And a few participants also stated that wayfinding required attention and concentration during the meeting. And in fact, walking meeting combines several practices that increase the workload of the activity. So we use the NASA TLX scale to assess the workload of the task. And the mental demand and effort were the highest dimension, which can be explained by the fact that distraction in the environment requires more attention to be focused in the, in the meeting itself. The frustration, for example, was the lowest dimension because it, it is consistent with the fact that the overall experience of participants was pretty good. We also highlighted some specific aspects of walking meeting. So for example, the social dynamics. It's interesting because participants stated that walking meetings are more informal than regular meetings at sit down meetings, which is consistent with the literature review. They are also more engaged in the conversation when they are walking outside because they cannot check their emails while walking. They are more in the meeting. The group size also may impact the communication of the group because when there are too many participants, it is more difficult. So compared to a sit down meeting, when you're walking, this is a drawback. You don't have the same access to everybody. And the group synchronization is also an important factor because everybody has a different walking speed. So you constantly need to adjust and you need to, to be aware of the rest of the group. Regarding the connection with the environment, people felt more energized and they felt less tired at the end of the meeting because they were outside and because they were having some fresh air. And the weather also positively impacted participants' mood, especially when it was sunny. However, the weather can become a barrier if it's not well, if it's not anticipated, if you're not well prepared for bad weather, for example, it can really become an obstacle to go walk outside for a walking meeting. There are a lot of disturbances in the environment. There are car noises, passerby, and all these things create a complex environment. We and environment or the environments present numerous stimuli which make harder sometimes the, the meeting. Participants reported that they have less control in order environment and sometimes it can cause privacy issues, which is a problem when sensitive topics are addressed in the meeting. Regarding the physical engagement, participants reported that they had more tonus because they were exercising their body. They, were, it's, they also stated that it's a physically demanding activity. For example, one participant was climbing the stairs 
And he wanted to say something, but he was out of breath. So it's also a physical, we need to take into account the physical demand. But we should also take into account the physiological needs. Several participants were too thirsty during the meeting that they wanted to drink water, but they couldn't because we were outside, of course. Walking meeting is a multitasking activity because you think, you talk, and you walk at the same time. So you only have a small portion of your attention in the conversation. And also there are, as we said, there are numerous sound and visual distractions in the environment. And that's why walking meeting requires attention because sometimes those elements can impact the conversation. And because walking meeting is a combination of both cognitive and physical activity, some participants stated that they could better organize their thoughts because they were walking outside. We also found out that participants didn't address the same topics before and after the walking meeting. So for example, the increase of the energy is one of the main benefits. And the disturbances are one of the main drawbacks. But those aspects have only been perceived after experiencing a walking meeting for the first time by the, by the participants. So that's why employee needs to be initiated to walking meetings to become aware of all the opportunities and challenges of this practice. Finally, the aim of this study was to map the experience of a first timer, as we said, and as we wanted to create onboarding solution to nudge people, to incite people to do more walking meeting and integrate more walking in their daily workday, we, we focused on the moment before the walking meeting. And here we highlighted the moment of choice, which are the moments when office workers decide to transform their sit down meeting into a walking meeting. So for example, when an, we could imagine that uh, we could imagine different de design opportunities to incite them to do work, working meeting. And for example, for the first one, when employees are planning a, to do a meeting, we could imagine that we could make them aware that a meeting is more suitable for them, that a working meeting is more suitable for their meeting to push them to do more working meetings. To conclude, through this study, we understood that barriers are more easily identified by first-timers and drivers. We also understood that first experience are unable to reinforce barriers and drivers, perceived drivers and barriers, but also to reveal the opportunities and challenges of, of working meeting. The experience map enabled us to highlight the moment of decision-making and to create onboarding solution to nudge office workers to do more walking meetings. Further to this study, we also wanted to analyze the participant practices of meeting through an online survey that we sent one and three months after the study. And we found out that five participants out of 13 did a walking meeting in the three months that follow the interview. So how can we incite the others to do more walking meetings? So we're creating onboarding concepts and we try to test them in a questionnaire with 200 office workers. And the results should enable us to create an artifact that nudge employee to integrate more working meeting into their work routine. So think again about the meeting you selected at the beginning. If when I ask you, could this meeting be held as a working meeting? If your answer was no, or maybe, try to think about this. What would encourage you to turn this meeting into a walking meeting? And to everybody, how can we promote walking meetings in our companies among our own colleagues? So next time you're planning a meeting, ask yourself if it could be a walking meeting. Thank you very much. All right, uh, can you hear us, uh, Melody? Yes thank, yes, thank you very much. Uh, and we have some time, five minutes or so, uh, for uh, discussion. And really, like, in fact, you started already a discussion in your last slides, uh, asking us questions that it is, and also need to think about uh, that, walking meetings. And I'm sure there are 
people in the room with ideas or questions for you. Let's see uh, if that is the case. So do you think you can have your next meeting as a, okay, please. Hi, uh, thank you for your presentation, uh, Melody. Uh, I'm a big proponent of walking meetings for sure. Uh, I guess my question is, uh, for one of the barriers that people mentioned is the distractions that took place, perhaps. But do you think that people sort of uh, acknowledge that when you're either sitting in the computer yourself doing Zoom meetings, that's a distraction too? And do you think that people weighed the distractions less when you're when you're out with walking meetings versus Thank you. Yeah, actually, there are a lot of distraction in the environment, but um, some uh, previous work also uh, demonstrated that the environment can become uh, an inspiring, an inspiring uh, source of information for the employee and for the meeting itself. So our participant told us that um, the physical activity enable us to. Uh, organize a thought to organize their speech and to think about new ID, but it was also thanks to the fact that they were outside and getting some fresh air. So of course there are distractions and it can um, have an impact on the efficiency of the meeting. So it's not working meeting is not a solution for all types of meetings, but it's more suitable for some types. And when it's possible, it would be great if employees could at least consider this valuable option uh, in their routine, in their work routine. Did it answer your questions? Yes, okay, yeah, I, I play with that. Let's see whether that works. I, I, I have also a question for you, Let me, like you just said in the end, yeah, that uh, it's also clear from your presentation, you showed uh, what, you know, what, what works, what not, and, and, and again, what in the end, the question be what types of meetings are, are suitable and maybe that's my question for you if, if you are trying you're getting understanding of that and maybe even of meetings that are not just okay and you have all the advantages health and so but they are even better as a meeting you get further by doing as a walking meeting that sitting somewhere from just from the point of view the aim of the meeting do, do you have an emerging understanding of that So yeah, one of the main uh, uh, barriers of working meeting is that uh, most of the time you need um, to share documents or you need to take notes. So those kinds of meetings like brainstorming or a formal presentation is more difficult. But in uh, other cases, such as, for example, when you are have to discuss just one with one colleague, or if you just need to sh share information, if it's just a discussion, it can be very beneficial to do a working meeting. And we also have some participants who actually did working meeting after the study, who said that they decided to do a working meeting because of, uh, one participant was because he wanted to have a private space to with his colleague to discuss a sensitive topic, but he couldn't find a space like this uh, in his uh, office and in uh, his building. So they just went outside. And another person also had to discuss some uh, sensitive topics uh, which uh, involved um, negative emotion in the meeting. So they decided to talk about this while walking because as we said, it's more, it creates a more informal connection and people are, it's, it's easier to talk about some topics sometimes. Thank you. <laughs> A last question? No, yes, no. Okay, uh, there are no questions, but but uh, thank you. That was very interesting. I think, I think people got to, to know your name, your research. I'm sure you will go on uh, with this and, and uh, uh, we'll keep track of this and, uh, and and possibly, or maybe even better, start experimenting ourselves uh, with walking meetings after that. So uh, thank you very much uh, again. To, uh, Sally Alanzari also online, and maybe if you share your screen, if Sally, you are uh, already uh, that. Um, yes, yeah. hello, can you hear me? Uh, my screen is, is shown on the screen. 
Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for uh, having me. This, I'm Dr. Saad. Yes. Uh, the screen are moving and uh, you can hear me as well. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> screen are shown in the screen. Uh, my slides are shown. Not yet. No. Yes. Probably now. Uh, is it moving? Yes, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Dr. Saleh Al Ansari uh, from Saudi Arabia. Uh, I'll be talking about the Saudi experience in using social media to include people in walking. Uh, I will be also uh, talking about this issue from my background as uh, a family phys and community physician. I used to walk myself. Uh, since more than 30 years and I am a health promotion activist as well as a very uh, long time working on advocacy on walking and uh, trying to use walking to change what we know about physical inactivity in uh, our areas and I really find that walking is a re really a magic solution for NCDs, non-communicable disease. I will summarize uh, sometime, something like 11 years in social media that is complementing my uh, long uh, experience in family medicine, community medicine. I'm trying also to mix academia with social media, how it might really change the, the attitude of people uh, in a country like uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, I will try also to answer the question is social media alone can do the job or we need to, so, to do something else we in Saudi Arabia and Gulf states are really very much dependent on cars and personal car is the uh, the, 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 the principal mode of transportation uh, metro is not yet working, although it is is being under construction in Riyadh. Uh, I don't know. I know only Emirates or Dubai to have uh, a metro, but all other Sa uh, Saudi and Gulf state cities don't have uh, a strong public transport uh, system. And in Saudi Arabia, what is very important to mention is that. Diabetes mellitus has grown from 5% to around 30% in only 40 years. And this is a very big number. And uh, I, recommend, I, I, I concentrated on using Twitter because it is uh, the main mode or the main platform of social media in Saudi Arabia. Uh, it was really very best. Uh, the, the best and what was selected among the walking groups and I joined Twitter since 2011. Uh, I use Twitter to concentrate only on walking and walking only not to talk about any other issues uh, other than walking and I use Twitter as my base camp although I used Facebook I used also Instagram Keeks uh, uh, other social media, but I concentrated very much on uh, on Twitter, and I have something like 144 followers. I used to also operate on Saudi HPC as a Twitter account, which has something like five, 58,000 uh, followers, and this is maybe the number of tweets so far over 11 years, something like 84,000 tweets since then. I also operate and supervise 
some other uh, Twitter accounts like Mushata Saudiya, which is Saudi Walkers, and another account on Walk Stories KSA. Uh, I used also Nike Running Club as one of the most uh, used applications to for the walking and walkers and we used to operate on virtual competitions walking uh, every day i uh, used we used to do a challenge of monthly walking of 150 kilometers and uh, a weekly marathon a weekly half marathon uh, and other uh, activities on social media Coming to the question, is social media alone enough? I think no, because I used to do also writing books. I wrote, wrote two books on uh, walking. One, uh, Walking and Health, the other book is Walking for Obesity. And I uh, uh, made something like what we call it audio tape and audio file that is also talking about the same thing, walking and issue. I also wrote something like 200 articles on walking. I translated something like 70 articles on walking from English to Arabic. And I wrote something like 70 stories for people who uh, managed to control their diabetes, hypertension, uh, coronary artery disease. And some of them used to stop the medications under medical uh, supervision. It is only... It is not only tweets, but uh, infographics, uh, tables that talk about speeds of walking. And also, I operated a lot of uh, walking in, in nature, uh, hiking trips inside and outside uh, Saudi Arabia. And I also translated the famous uh, YouTube film written and produced by Mike Evans from Canada. The name is 23 and a half uh, hours. This is the name of the video. And it was shown by more than 12 million viewers since it was uh, uh, uploaded on the net in Arabic uh, until 2012. It was that one of the top 10 at that week on uh, and these some statistics about it. And to include all people, I used to do, to do on more than one platform. You Twitter, Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, YouTube, as well as Keek at that time. And also including ladies and gentlemen in these walking groups and support all the walking activities. And this is a famous also Twitter account that I used to operate and supervise Saudi walkers, which is talking about uh, more than 200 walking groups. And this uh, account is having something like 6,200 followers since 2016. Uh, it spreads the word on walking. It supports the walking groups. We share activities as well as support our uh, groups in social media. Uh, also, uh, Tricks of Arabia is the name of the account that uh, I supervise that talking about walking in nature. We operated something like 180 hiking trips and it was very much covered in on social media. And these are the uh, some of the, I mean, the stories we published about uh, curing non-communicable disease through walking. I also used to show in many TV uh, talk shows and interviews over the last uh, more than 15 years, as well as publishing a lot of articles. And this is probably the most important walking group in Saudi Arabia called Mushat al-Riyadh, Riyadh Walkers. We used to walk since seven years. Every Friday, we walk for 10 kilometers and we used to cover our activities uh, on social media. I also use the power of word and talking about walking in social media, utilizing our, our Arabic culture and our history in the peninsula. And I also 
did something on the a national level where I can consider all Saudi walkers as my friends. And we used to walk in Riyadh, Yambur, Medina, all the cities you may know about in Saudi Arabia, where there are a walking groups in each uh, city. Also making a real friendship and uh, as well as uh, doing all these activities where we motivate people, we use Nike, uh, running club we use the power of image people used to follow us and join our activities and our groups through uh, social media and this is a great difference on between what is happening now and what we used to happen what what used to happen uh, over several years back when uh, the media was only controlled by the uh, uh, ministries and the government but now social media has given us a very good space uh, to to cover and mention uh, i mean spread the word on walking among saudi population gulf states as well as arab states these are the logos of a lots of walking groups that can reach to 200 walking group in saudi arabia i used to support i used to publish i used to join and really uh, I, we, we could make a lot of working groups, uh, something like more than 20 groups in Riyadh alone, and a total of 200 groups. Uh, uh, and we can see a lot of improvement. And I hope that we do a thorough uh, sort of, uh, or of uh, literature review or uh, good scientific research to see what has happened over the last 10 years. But we are seeing some great changes or something that we can use. One of them is the physical activity in Saudi Arabia, according to the, to the Ministry of Statistics or uh, the Authority of Statistics in Saudi Arabia. Uh, they mentioned that pop physical education, physical activity, sorry, has risen by 9% over the last two years between 2019-2021 and also Google Trend shows us that people, Saudi people are the most frequently uh, people in the world who can, who, who is going to Google to ask about uh, walking and search about walking. Uh, the take home message using social media is to do perseveration, continuity, sustainability, and uh, not to make uh, one show and uh, disappear. The other thing is to involve people, support them, uh, work with others, uh, formulate working groups. We find that working groups are one of the strongest tools to spread the word and the practice and the culture of working in Saudi Arabia. Uh, these tools really has made walking uh, like infectious. A lot of people uh, watch us on social media for several months, then they show up and join our uh, groups. Probably this is what all what I can do and I can say about uh, what has happened on Saudi Arabia using social media. The take home message, it is not only social media, but field work, on the ground that is covered by social media is the secret and the, the really the the, the 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 good equation to combine field work with social media coverage i think that's all for tonight, for now i'm waiting for your questions thank you very much <laughs> I don't know whether you heard uh, there was a big applause, maybe you didn't hear, but there was, I think, uh, like I am, uh, people are really impressed, I'm really impressed, <laughs> I think uh, there's much uh, to learn uh, from you, uh, you're, you're not here, so we can we cannot have, uh, 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 yeah, conversations uh, in the breaks and, uh, and learn about all the, 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 the tricks you have to to learn as uh, 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 behind this impressive 
results. So maybe there are there are yes, there is a question here. Yes, please. Yeah, good afternoon. My name is Professor uh, Manelich, and it's a bit colder over here than with you. I saw your street, it's like 40 degrees. Is that right? So you have 40 degrees, and the next question would be how as you kind of are feeling or used to this climate with the hot temperatures and walking, how could we deal with walking and learning from you in terms of feeling the heat while walking? How can we cope with that? Yeah. Uh, can you repeat the question? The sound is not too clear to me, please. Uh, would you? Uh, uh, about the issue of heat. Eh? Yes, so, uh, getting hotter here as well, you must have more experience. How can you motivate people to walk when it's so uh, hot outside? Uh huh. Yes. We used to make our walking activities mainly early in the morning and we have this uh, man, uh, friday walk for around 10 kilometers that usually start around 4 30 or 5 o'clock in the morning and we do our long distance walking on each saturdays where we used to walk for around half marathon marathon which is something like 21 kilometers again early in the morning we used also walking at night and uh, the other thing to mention is that in saudi arabia we have something like six to eight months of good weather it is not only it is not hot uh, weather throughout the year we have a winter where the the temperature goes down to maybe uh, two uh, centigrade five centigrade sometimes it goes down to zero early in the morning in the winter time so we can manage whether it is morning morning or at night or winter will be a very good time to walk throughout the day maybe Um, Karen Labry from Victoria, Canada, and I noticed uh, you mentioned the Nike Running Club. I was interested to know if you have different speed groups. So would you have people that were walking slowly and then perhaps people walking quicker? And then are there running groups involved? Is it is it a continuum of different uh, activities under walking? Yes. From, my, from our experience, we used to work with an inactive community really and that was five ten years back uh, what i used to say to people that walking is the first sport or physical activity that can take you from inactivity to activity a lot of the people who used to join started with walking then they moved into hiking running cycling and they used to do other sports but uh, as a physician i used to talk about physical activity uh, as a whole but emphasizing very much on walking so that people can move from inactivity to activity then when they become active become active then they can choose whatever they like and Lots, some of them they used to join uh, fitness clubs, but we need to build the behavior of moving and doing something. And we found walking as the best way to start into physical activity. And we have a lot of walking group, running groups, as well as uh, some cycling groups as well. So maybe maybe I ask one last question. Uh, uh, I mean, the, the 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 campaign how it grew the the the, 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 the follower. I mean, it, it's it's incredible, and 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 apparently there are some, some effects. Uh, of course, maybe there are other factors. If if I had to ask you, um, what do you see as the main barriers? For, for walking, become really having a breakthrough in, in, in Saudi Arabia and the Gulf State, becoming 
a, a norm. And eh? now maybe driving a car is the norm, or walking becoming the norm. What, what you see as main barrier, also a way to break through those, uh, yes. those barriers. I have to talk about two main issues in this regard. One of is them, one of them is that our uh, cities are still designed for cars. And although there are a lot of uh, changes uh, that is taking place gradually, uh, and uh, more and more walking paths are being built over the last five to ten years, and I think it will take some time before our cities become walking friendly and cycling friendly. This is the main. Uh, this is the the, the first uh, obstacle. The other one is having walking not only as a social media activity for active people or advocates or activists. And I, I think that the other challenge we need to face is that. We need to do as what have you been done in uh, UK or Ireland, the other uh, industrial countries, where this issue has become one of the issues for the government or for the institutions. And to summarize, I want to have a time where walking is becoming more and more institutionalized, where it has become an institutional issue, not only activities or advocacy for certain people. Now, thanks a lot. Uh, we have to, to close now, but it was really great and I think uh, inspirational to, to have you here. Uh, and uh, so thank you very much. Thank you. On to the last speaker, we really start for you play, so we have 20 minutes also for you. Uh, the speaker is here, as so you can uh, 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 see that uh, uh, Jean, now, uh, I probably didn't pronounce it right, but she joined us from uh, the mother of Korea, uh, where she works at the Detention Urban Research Institute. And uh, it is a bit of, of a different presentation, you might think it's about. Mm -hmm. Uh, Maple Share Street, I mean, super interesting. So, streets, I mean, you, you uh, tell us about that. But so, in a way, it's about, uh, you know, the, the, the experience of walking in, in, in particular environments, in particular linked to issues of safety. So, in the context of this uh, session, maybe uh, the way we should, we could lo look at this uh, uh, next week in Sarai to see also the experience as something that could uh, motivate people uh, to work or not. And maybe something you could also use uh, to, uh, to, to, to motivate. Uh, but please, thank you. Yes, yes, yes. Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Jihee Namjoon and I'm from Korea. And uh, I'm going to talk about a little bit about the neighborhood chairs to under three kilometers per hour. Uh, it's about the pension safety challenges beyond speed reduction. And uh, it's, uh, it's this presentation is from a part of my doctoral thesis last year. I just got related. <laughs> 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 Because you know my doctoral uh, you know, proposal and the uh, committee meeting was all virtual, yes. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so I'm really happy to be here and share you guys. And maybe the topic is a little bit off hint because it's about the speed reduction and safety measures, mainly. But you know, like it's also about the uh, eliminating. Uh, some obstacles that prevent people from everyday walking. So that's, uh, we are all related to each other. So uh, I ho hopefully I will try to make it short and clear so you can have lunch. And then, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, my English is uh, you know, like I'm not gonna. <laughs> I'm not sure that it will be fluent as I want. But um, okay, let's just get started. 
Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, here is an overview, and I'm um, starting with a brief background about the in my study. And then I'll do some of the selected uh, data and analysis and findings from my study. Uh, the takeaways for better practice you need to discuss the questions. So, uh, this is the top of the street I'm going to talk about. It's called Neighborhood Chair Street. Uh, it's a, called Tenghai Duro in Korean, but it literally, literally means the living streets. It's like almost every, in every neighborhood. Have this kind of street. So, uh, as of today, 77% of the street network in Seoul is consists of this narrow street under the 12 meters. So, it means that they have don't have they don't have enough space to like build sidewalk for pedestrians. So, the result is that you have to deal with the, all the kind of vehicles and activities and the borders and everything. Everything in the same place. And as you can see, um, this kind of street uh, serves as the local access street and very low in the low road hierarchy. And they, uh, but they are very important in, in like terminal access. And uh, those are mainly in the fine grain, finely grained and densely built up residential and commercial areas. So within those kind of like uh, arterial roads and super roads, inner streets are kind of like this condition. And then uh, you have uh, active frontages on both sides of the street wall and very fre frequent access to shops and homes and people who are cars are getting in and out everywhere. So when you uh, walk down this kind of street, you would find yourself in, like a bit <laughs> distracted and you know, like Offended sometimes, it's not a very comfortable uh, type of walking place, especially for vulnerable users like kids or other people. They have a, some sometimes they have difficulties to negotiate their way throughout this kind of conflicts. But in other hands, uh, this kind of street doesn't have any like uh, conventional street design elements, but they are not fully equipped because you know, like, of the lack of space, the lack of the space and everything. So they don't have you know, center line, lanes, curves, signal lines, no, none of those kind of things. It's just a space of asphalt paving and that's all. So you have to like, get in your way. In somehow, but it's, it's the Maybe why these kind of streets are so common, so common in Seoul, because it's you know like it provides uh, the most flexible way to use the limited space in Seoul. So maybe this wasn't the best, but maybe we have to even deal with this kind of space. But and the intervention side of it in to improve these kind of conditions is not that easy always because you know the like, can make this kind of uh, really pretty sidewalk, but it's, as you see, it's occupied by parking cars, or you know, like it's very common. So, as a result, uh, people still have to walk in carriages, but the space is uh, even more narrow. And, um, like, you have a sidewalk, so it's the uh, it's on the pedestrian side to push into the other space and rights. Uh, it's on the pedestrian wall to like, be outside the sidewalk. So if you have horizon or something, and you have the greater risk, risk and the responsibility at the same time. So, so for the um, uh, to uh, handle this challenge, we adopted a shared street approaches uh, for this kind of thing. So, uh, to improve the pedestrian environment and safety in those kind of narrow mixed street, the only concept or design methods can work here 
was probably the shared history. So what we did was we, uh, we got uh, launched in 2013, uh, a program called Hedison Fire Streets. This is like a PPS, very renowned. <laughs> I call this a PPS. <coughs> So we get final program in Seoul started in 2013, and over then uh, 100 pilot cases has been implemented around the Seoul. And uh, what we got here is the design features are mainly about the pavement because of the limited space. We don't have any children store in the space occupying those kind of elements in there. So just we change the pavement. But like with color and patterns that are more friendly than to pedestrians than for cars. And then a little bit of uh, speed measure can also be invited. And then overall streetscape uh, to create a sense of place for street activities. It's not just an asphalt play uh, car carriageway, but it's a place for living. That's what we had to you know, deliver. Uh, so, but uh, the one thing that caught attention, caught my attention in this case was the speed. You know, like as you, uh, as you and I might probably or support the speed reduction for pedestrian safety is very you know, the key elements of traffic coming and you know, like make a safe car safer place for everyone. Uh, so uh, the slower, the safer is the you know, main. Most of the designers or practitioners or policy makers or researchers would not you know, like, uh, deny that uh, in, as in general. As you can see, the probability or security, the quality of traffic access tend to decrease at more lower speed and Especially uh, beyond the certain threshold, the fatality becomes near zero. So that's why we are introducing some so many cities are using two, 20 miles per hour or 30 kilometers per hour as a standard. Uh, but the, this beautiful S curve also shows that the gradients are not always the same. So if you are reducing 60, 60 to 50, 50 for it and pull it. Sorry, it does not mean the same effect you get. So uh, that's the tricky point here. Uh, in the uh, back to our soul case, uh, what I got is a uh, very you know, small figures. I hope you imagine it. <laughs> uh, we uh, measure the speed, actual speed in our sites, but the average was 18 kilometers per hour and nearly. One of the cases exceeds uh, 30 kilometers. So it's already below the line. So we don't do it now. And then, uh, so it means that you introduce the 30 kilometer limits. It does not make any difference for you know, like status quo. So, and even after the intervention, it's, uh, this work shows that uh, X exit means the previous speed and Y means the <laughs> change in speed. But as you can see, some of them increased <laughs> other than you know, like making it slower, you, we made it faster. <laughs> so it, what, a, what an embarrassing point for our practitioners, but we were very confused. And then, uh, was it good or bad? It needs to be answered to go on to the next step. So, so how to interpret this, you know, <laughs> this result we got? Did it make it even you know, like riskier for pedestrians by making it faster? But we did all the effort work and <laughs> changes made. I, I thought our action wasn't that wrong. So, uh, so we got the premise of that uh, 30 kilometers speed limits and speed reduction could help save speech. That's our expectation. You know? And uh, the reality is not like that. So, so we, what we have to do, what I think we had to do was that we had to pattern the validity of speed reduction under this kind of condition. Yay, let's see 
what happens. So, uh, as you see in the fatality graph, it's uh, below 30 kilometers, it's uh, almost zero. So, it has no difference between um, 30 or 15 or 20 kilometers. It doesn't make difference. So, I have uh, instead of the fatality rate, just accent frequency for uh, risk factor. And then we will see if, if the validity uh, means yes. If it means yes, the curve will look like the left one. So slower, the safer, it will walk no matter what. So we have to still have to make it slower. So in that case, what we need to do is the stronger measures to make it slower, right? And then what if a uh, curve looks like this? It means that we have under the 30 kilometers, we have another threshold that can significantly drop the excellent rate. Maybe it would be 20 or 15 or 10. And then we're going to adopt new speed limits for those kind of reduction. But what if it's not valid? The graph will show nothing, no reaction. Okay? So that was my type of metric, the wizard. It triggered me again. So, <laughs> because what happened here is that I used the uh, PPS data and so about the survey data, about pedestrian flow, vehicle flow, and the average speed on one hand. And on the other side, I, I have the excellent data. And I just plotted it and I could do the let the computer do the cluster things or. <laughs> To you know, like uh, suckle out those kind of similar cases together. Uh, so what I got here is that there's no such case with you know, like high speed and high expense both combined together. There's no such site. No coincidence between the high risk and high and the high speed. In other than that, we have three different clusters. I call it ABC. It's right. That's the flow chart, but with the speed and the exit. So we have the A, B, C here. Well, why do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean? Where and why? Why are so? It's, it's like a, a, not like what we expect for the B. So the A, type of A cluster. Uh, the cases with most frequent accidents were associated with the relative low speed. But as you can see in the title page, the picture, can you imagine anyone who bears speed up <laughs> in those kind of streets, right? You know, if you have the people around and you don't know where, when, or when someone's got the habit at any moment. So if you gotta speed down, not totally. <laughs> But those kind of uh, streets are still having very frequent access. So maybe uh, uh, I, I maybe talk about some like Antonia Road, Super Glass, and Inner Street. Those are like uh, among those inner streets, they are most frequently used and most heavily like activated areas, so there's a lot of cars, a lot of pollution. That means rather accidents, no matter your speed, was <laughs> how low it is. So and on the other hand, the closer B has the low side of the accident, but they are very fast. Uh, they are very fast. Well, what, what's the problem with <laughs> that? Uh, I first need to understand that why is it causing more accidents? Isn't it causing more accident than the slow ones? And the, I just realized that when I see the sign, uh, drivers are uh, making decisions about this environment. It's not that annoying, or it's not that, uh, not that dangerous. Uh, so they can uh, speed up a little bit. So that's what they did. <laughs> uh, so the, the, in that kind of uh, street, driver's decision mm -hmm. to accelerate or decelerate would depend on their perceived level of safety. And that's the one here. And then uh, some streets are both low in the uh, all low in the flow, speed, and access, and everything. Then those are very quiet spaces uh, for you know, people live. 
So uh, this is the final conclusion. <laughs> <laughs> all of a sudden, <laughs> but you know, like, uh, I what what I uh, got through this confusing and un unexpected or even undesirable result. What I got out from there was that you have been like more one side of everything, right? And then uh, I have the four restraints of speed. One is the physical barrier or the behavior interaction with others, the users, and some, you know, like some about uh, uncertainty or you know, like feeling unsafe can also make you slow down. So the, the, it, it is, I call the defensive response to the you know, like unkind environment. And the first one is social awareness, view, respect, Others, so you are willing to slow down, whether it's safe or not. Okay, so maybe we are talking about the traffic coming and speed reduction. We think about the only ones, the positive ones, but you know, like in actual street, the speed is you know, the all those kind of things combined together. As a result, you got this speed at this street, right? And on the other hand, the accent. Is caused by very you know, like various uh, variables are um, uh, associated with the accident. Uh, speed is one of the very powerful indicators that you know, like can reduce the accident, but in, not in every case, right? <laughs> so, so some some kind of street environment needs more than speed to prevent accident. That's what I found out from there. And uh, uh, from these three clusters, speed was not uh, determinant <laughs> of the level of safety, but more like acted like a reserve determined by that. And low speed can sometimes be bad side. So because it, it, it's too crowded, because there's so much clutter, so you cannot speed, but that's not good for pedestrians either. So maybe in that case, speeding up for cars because of you remove the, those clutters and you make it better, and it doesn't work for us at all. So maybe you can better and approximate according to your street type, your speed, the actual causes of the risk. Um, not other than you know, like always thinking of us being. <laughs> so uh, the last uh, picture is that, you know, like in Korea, we are actually doing this kind of thing again, like, the, you know, posting those speed signs very big and you know, like oppressive that tell the drivers to slow, slow down, but they are already not the best. <laughs> but what you need here is not the Science <laughs> tells you this one, you should obey this like that, but you know, like more like this kind of like friendly speed to street skate as a whole environment to you know, like um, let the people uh, instantly know that what kind of place is this. So, thank you for me. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, very much. I really like how, how these unexpected results help you uh, us have a more complex understanding of uh, this information in speed and safety. Uh, we should take time for one or two questions uh, before the lunch. Uh, yeah. Yes. Um, did you measure volume of pedestrians and traffic, and how did that you you know if you use that as an exposure, how did that change the risk? Oh yeah, the, the who was more determinant of the uh, extent than the speed. Uh, so the, if we have a heavy floor, you have more extent, but speed goes down. That's the right amount. Uh, so better Volumes rose were measured, and I you know, as you saw, as I put in the flow chart, it was included in the clustering. Okay. Thank you.
Yes. Yeah, uh, I, Kevin from After All. Did you decide to make any of the streets uh, car free? Oh. Oh, that's the next level I would be working on because, you know, like first, because the A high, what they need is, you know, the, uh, alleviating their level of conflict other than speed down. So maybe time management about the carpet street would help you there mm -hmm. other than the, reducing the speed. But uh, uh, in our policy level, we have you know, like other type of program that are promoting the carpet street or it's not uh, linked yet. Maybe I will working on it. I'll be working on it. And is there a conclusion? Because I'm sure what I found interesting also the spirals of painting the streets uh, different, and then you kind of said correctly, you said there was no effect of even making it. Uh, I think so. Is your conclusion that it's totally useless to do like? Uh, well, I was frustrated uh, first, at first. Um, that we think thinking of it in that way, but similar, I realized it, it still helps because you know, it, uh, it's not as effective as we expected to you know, reducing the street, the street uh, speed, but you know, like, to make it more friendly and walkable environment for all, it still and one of the doable thing. Yeah. So maybe our criteria, you know, like you cannot properly measure the amount of accident, how it went up or went down <laughs> in a short period of time yeah. after the intervention. So we were, okay, were to get very easier option yeah. uh, that the, to take the speed as the proxy for the third. So if you have lower speed, it's safer. It's, it's what many other practitioners thought, but maybe it's not the case. The speed is not, isn't that, you know, closely indicator that represents the level of safety. So, that's a way longer time to do also look at other types. Okay. Yes, last question. Yeah, more a reflection than anything. I think yeah. these kind of really provocative results, they really raise a lot of questions about the way people think about traffic on and that we have to stop thinking about it from a single criteria, how many people get run over, to a multi-criteria perspective, because the kinds of streets that you're showing 30 kilometers is way too fast. Right. That's insane. That's not traffic calming. I don't care if, it, if there's a table or whatever. We all use that table, but that's not enough because you have to define the street according to, to the context. If you want people walking to have priority, five kilometers an hour is traffic calming. Right, right. Five, no more than five. If you want to make it a cycling street, which is a little more compatible, but not fully compatible with walking, it's 12 to 15 kilometers. I know some cyclists, a lot of cyclists go fast, but still. But the other thing is that it's really important to look at the kind of traffic going through the street because there's people who live there who always have to be able to go in and out. And if they have cars, they need to go in and out in their cars. But then there's people who are looking for parking because most of our neighborhoods now, especially in, in, around city centers of any kind, are now parking lots. That's what we live in, parking lots. And parking generates a, a very specific kind of tr driving behavior that's very dangerous, right? People speed up to try and grab that spot and they get into fights because they want this spot and, and they're not really paying attention to children playing on the road or anything. Third kind of traffic is the most, is the worst because these applications now like Waze they send traffic, huge amounts of traffic, through small residential streets and small commercial streets as well. And it, you don't want that. It, that's a really negative phenomenon for walking, for health, for air pollution, for 
just about every, anything to do with life. And so the idea that traffic comp, because traffic comping, when I learned it, it was like about reducing the amount of traffic, not just the speed. And, and it seems now that it's all like 30 kilometers an hour is synonymous with traffic calming. So I think we really need to go back over that and radically change the way people think about it. I totally agree. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the because you know, like if the 30 kilometers is not enough, then 22 can I feel my answer was oh, I because you know like I personally drive in those kind of streets. I feel like Oh my God, it was so fast that I look at the, it's a little bit, it's like 12. <laughs> <laughs> so the relative speed uh, is, maybe it's in our you know, country. Like, you know, like you have to behave uh, in, in, you know, like in relation to the other users and other environment. It's the first, it has to first priority. It has to be the first priority. Then, the, it, then we may you know, like discuss about hands right. Oh no, no, it is <laughs> those kind of issues. So maybe not the number, and maybe equally me drivers shouldn't you know, pay attention about the three signs or cameras or your own accelerometer. You know, but in other than that, you have to look around. If people are around, those kind of things were more important to me. So that's what I was trying to say with the uh, last images. So thank you for Well, I think we have enough to think about and chat uh, over at lunch where we now have to go. I guess I thank you, everybody, you, and everyone for this session. Thank you. 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 Thank you.